Ladies and gentlemen, I think we will get underway. Having ventured outside briefly at noon hour, you'll be comforted to know that the weather out there is even worse than it is in here. Uh, one more comment on the questions. Uh, as I mentioned, our panel this afternoon appears to be untitled. I'm not sure whether that was by accident or design, but I'm told by the chairman that they want questions dealing with any aspect of securities law, not particularly limited to matters arising out of the Emerson, O'Connor, Coleman, or Day papers. And uh, again, if you would just put them in the box here or the box upstairs. I've been told by Mr. Coleman to keep his introduction very short and not to go into all his many virtues and accomplishments and achievements. So I will try to do that. Um, I think uh, Gordon's main claim to fame is that he will be the most excited speaker you'll see at this series. I once in a special lecture actually saw Gord get excited about the contents of an information circular. So I'm not sure what that promises for this afternoon. Um, Gordon's subject, of course, is takeover bids and issuer bids. And it would be, I think, inappropriate for Gordon as a partner of the Tory firm to talk about any transaction involving any clients of the Tory firm. So I expect that will leave him with absolutely nothing to say, but I turn you over to him in any event. Gordon? Thanks, Jack. That, that word was exciting, not excited. <laughs> I have a very short uh, leash here today. Uh, I guess now that uh, uh, we've started about five minutes late, it'll be about a 40-minute uh, talk. I've uh, <clears throat> attempted to divide the topic up into several areas. I'll mention them to begin with so that you have an idea of a, you'll have a road map, really, of where I'm trying to go. Um, First of all, I should say that there are probably four groups of people here. Uh, there are the people who have spent some time in this area and, and for whom the law and the lore is um, pretty familiar, and for them it'll be a bit of a recap. Uh, there are others who are undoubtedly here who uh, have heard me speak about these topics at the law school and from, indeed from this podium. There will be others who are more interested in the litigation aspects of this matter, and for them, I, I hope that some of the cases, both the unreported and the reported cases, that we'll be talking about will be of some interest, particularly in the area of director's duties and responsibilities. And I guess for the, for the, uh, the, the final group, uh, there will be a number of people for whom the subject matter is relatively unfamiliar uh, and for whom... Uh, the matters discussed both in this conversation and in the, um, this rather one-sided conversation, and in the paper uh, will be uh, an opportunity to find out where we've come from, where we are, and where we're going in the, in the area. I've divided the topic up into the background uh, to take care of the where we've come from. Secondly, uh, the role of directors of an offeree company of a target company, in other words, in a takeover bid. And I've broken that further down into two main categories. Uh, the director's circular, uh, what information should be contained and, and what factors are relevant in directors of an offeree company advising the uh, offeree shareholders. And the second main category under the director's duties and responsibilities uh, area is uh, an analysis of the American jurisprudence in the light of what it teaches us in terms of the Canadian and English jurisprudence having regard to the fact that the underpinnings, the legislative underpinnings of both the CBCA and the OBCA um, are common in the, um, in, in the American jurisprudence that, 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 that considers the matter. The third major topic is multi-step acquisitions. Those are takeover bids by way of uh, private agreements and um, stock exchange purchased, purchases followed up with a circular or a stock exchange bid. I'm going to spend a few moments by way of the fourth topic on acquisition techniques and talk a little bit about option agreements, standstill agreements, and confidentiality agreements. Um, fifth, uh, a, a brief word about uh, the, the offering 
uh, which the takeover bid circular and the preparation of the, of, the, of the circular by the bidder with particular emphasis on a, on a specialized problem which I've characterized for reasons which have become apparent as the problem of the outside, inside, insider. Um, the sixth topic is uh, a brief mention of fairness opinions. Um, seventh, uh, a discussion of the fiduciary obligations owing by controlling shareholders to the minority. Eighth, uh, which I, I will not deal with in, in any detail in this talk, but which is dealt with in, to some extent in the paper, collateral agreements and follow-up offers, a much <laughs> overworked topic, I should say, by the Securities Commission. And, I, and one topic that I, I really do hope to, to get into, the, the problem of remedies, the problem of implied rights of action and the application in the securities law area of the Seneca College case decided fairly recently by the Supreme Court of Canada. So that's the roadmap. By way of, of the background, I should say that in the last four years, um, takeover bids have eliminated the significant portions of the public float on the Toronto Stock Exchange. That, that is a term that's used to describe the the shares which are held by the general investing public, the publicly traded shares. For instance, in 1978, takeover bids reduced the float by $2.2 billion out of a market float of $36 billion. In 1981, uh, the figures have been compiled up to the end of August. Takeover bids and, and insider bids removed 6.5 billion from the float, or over 8% of the, of the total float as measured in terms of, of end of 1980 dollars. Now, to get the, the, the accurate figure, you've got to take that 6.5 and net it off against new issues during the period, the eight-month period ended August 31, 1981. And there were a billion five of new issues, so that the float loss, that is, that is securities not available because the companies are either not, no longer publicly traded or very few shares are publicly traded, resulted in uh, a, a diminution of about five billion dollars worth of the float. And, and I'm sure just a, 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 ref, a brief reflection, you'll, you'll recall the names, the litany uh, of, of the companies which have either ceased to be publicly traded or in respect of which there is a very small amount of stock traded. It makes interesting and disquieting reading. Abitibi Price, Brass Can, Canada Permanent Mortgage Corporation, Canadian Utilities, Domtar, Hudson's Bay Company, Kaiser Resources, Koffler Stores, Macmillan Bloedel, Maple Leaf Mills, Noranda, Norsen, Pacific Petroleum, Petrofina, the Price Company, Simpsons, TransCanada Pipelines, West Steel Roscoe, Zellers. Either gone or very few shares publicly available. Now, the, the uh, phenomenon has produced its own literature, its own uh, jargon. Uh, the um, financial press has produced a plethora of articles on how to spot and hunt for takeover bid candidates and lists have been published of, of possible target companies. Uh, chief, chief executive's reaction, if he finds his company's name on that list, is, I suppose, very similar to that of uh, spotting his wife in a burlesque line. The, uh, the reaction of the offeree shareholder, however, is, is sometimes very different because the offeree shareholder spots the possible premium that will be paid uh, if he is fortunate enough to hold shares in a company that is going to be taken over. We'll be getting into the problem of, uh, of the shrinkage of that premium as a result of the careful planning of takeover bids by way of private agreement purchases and, and stock exchange purchases prior to the announcement of the bid. In other words, if the stock is purchased on the market, it's purchased at market, presumptively and the premium value that would have to be paid in order to get acceptance by a large number of shareholders is, uh, do doesn't have to be paid. So that the average cost, if you like, to the offeror is reduced if he can purchase 
by a combination of private agreements and normal course purchases, uh, uh, say 25, 30 percent of the shares so that he needs only to go to the go to a stock exchange bid or a circular bid for uh, 30 percent or 20 percent to bring himself up to 51 percent of the shares if he, if he wants legal control. The Securities Commission has developed a theory, which we'll get into in a minute, which is called the linked transaction theory, which it has asserted in a number of cases. Uh, the uh, Macmillan Bladell Domtar case of a few years ago, the FedNav Abitibi Price transaction, and in in the case of linkage after the bid, uh, the GenStar acquisition of the shares of First City at a price higher than the, the price paid to the ordinary shareholders under the bid. The, uh, the Commission has naturally been involved to a great degree in this uh, phenomenon. They have, sh they have displayed a very activist role. They have uh, endeavored to uh, fill the regulatory gaps where they have perceived them. Um, the feedback f in this respect is, is mixed. Uh, the, the judge in the first city, Gen Star Canada Permanent Triangle, Mr. Justice Reed, uh, was quite taken by the role of the Securities Commission. He concluded that, they, that the commission was better fitted, I'm quoting, by its jurisdiction, its nature, and its expertise to maintain a watchdog supervision over the required level of disclosure and takeover bid contests, and it's mo more flexible in its remedies. The uh, then Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs, uh, in a speech in January, uh, raised, however, the question, invited the, the Toronto Society of Financial Analysts to consider whether or not the courts should be the arbitrators of these disputes. Now, that is something that we expect to touch on in the, in the panel discussion, so I'll say no further, no more about that. Dean Beck will address that issue in the panel discussion. Let me say a brief word about the American materials. Um, as I said, the underpinnings of the corporate law are, are virtually identical. The policy imperatives, therefore, are the same, and the Supreme Court of Canada in the Pacific Coast Coin Exchange case said that where the policy uh, is, is the same, speaking in that case of the 1933 Act, the Securities Act in the United States, and our Securities Act, the Ontario Securities Act. And where there is a dearth of Canadian authorities, they said it is, wa it is a wise course to look at the decisions reached by U.S. courts. The, the 11 sections or so in the takeover bid um, portion of the Securities Act, which run from about 88 to 100, stem from the 1965 report known as the Kimber Report, which articulated in Chapter 3 the approach that should be adopted in Ontario's takeover bid legislation. They recommended a statutory code which would set time limits, how long the bid should remain open, when the deposited shares may be withdrawn, uh, to eliminate the, the vices that were prevalent at that time, the first come, first served offer, which created a stampede among offeree shareholders. They wanted to set up a set of time limits which would provide adequate information to shareholders of offeree companies. In other words, the bid must remain open for a minimum of 21 days in order to, to provide what is known now as, as adequate think time time for the shareholders of the offeree company to, del to, del to deliberate on whether or not to accept or reject the bid or to sell their shares in the market, and to provide sufficient time for the directors of the offeree company to assess the bid and advise the shareholders of the offeree company whether or not to accept or reject the bid, which is known as reaction time. Well, the think time and the reaction time are the basic building blocks of the Kimber report and the, the relevant paragraphs, 314, 315, and 316, which uh, have been quoted a number of times recently by the Securities uh, Commission, provide the intellectual basis, if you like, for the development of the law. Which leads us, I think, easily into the role of the directors in a takeover bid. 
the shareholders must have time to think, the directors must have time to advise them. What is the role of, of the directors? Well, they uh, are obliged to issue a director's circular. They are not obliged under the statute to recommend either acceptance or rejection of the bid, although this is commonly done. To avoid legal responsibility, the directors will typically ask their counsel to outline the relevant ingredients uh, and guidelines for reasonable behavior in the circumstances, and uh, they will ask uh, their investment advisors to help them formulate a, reason, a, a reasoned approach to the question of value, whether or not the bid that's on the table is an appropriate bid, whether or not it's time to sell, whether or not the values are obscured, etc. There has been a major decision in the, the past little while which has dealt with the question of the director's duties and responsibilities in a, in a, in a takeover bid circular, and that's the Royal Trusco decision which examined the, whether or not the directors of Royal Trusco had discharged their duties and responsibilities in informing their shareholders with respect to the Campo bid. The circular in Royal Trusco stated that the directors had been advised by a large number of persons who came to be popularly known as, quote, friends of Royal Trusco, by a large number of persons that they intend to purchase shares of Royal Trusco in the market during the offer period. I'm still quoting. Many have stated that their purposes include maintaining Royal Trusco as a public company, not under the control of a single individual or corporation. The obligation in the statute is to state the particulars of information which could reasonably be expected to affect the decision of the shareholders to accept or reject the offer, and five of the seven members of the commission who participated in the decision concluded that the circular was misleading because it omitted the, quote, more accurate statement that, in that again, quoting, in excess of 50 percent of the shares were held by persons or corporations who had indicated that they were purchasing for investment only and not for the purpose of tendering under the bid. How this additional statement, which the OSC wished to see in the circular, would have affected the shareholder's decision as to accepting or rejecting the bid or selling in the market, the decision does not make clear. The commission referred to an American decision, Piper and Chris Craft, which was a decision on reckless disregard of uh, whether something was true or false, so it may not necessarily have been an, an apposite uh, reference. And the, drawing from that decision, the Commission articulated the, the duty as a duty to be meticulous and precise in their representations to the shareholders. Query whether this formulation of the director's duty fits with the reasonableness context of the statute, our statute, unlike the American statute, which was at issue in the case quoted by the Commission, has a reasonableness of the prudent man statute in it. Query also why that obligation to act re like a reasonably prudent man would act was not discharged when the directors of Royal Trust Go acted in good faith, which was admitted by the commissioners, and acted throughout in accordance with legal advice uh, which was also admitted by the commissioners. A most puzzling decision. The other questions that bedevil the minds of the directors in, in putting together a bid are value-related questions. In the paper, I've dealt with the criteria that are customarily used, the asset value, market value, dis discounted cash flow approach. I won't bore you with it now. An important ingredient also in, determin in, de in determining how valuable a bid is, is an analysis of the pro rata character of the bid. In other words, if an offeror is bidding at $30 a share for 35 percent of the shares and all the, sh the shareholders uh, tender under the bid, 100 percent of them tender under the bid, then 
35 percent of the shares will be taken up at 30 bucks a share. And if the bid price at the post bid price is $23 a share, falls back after the bid's finished, 65 percent of the shares would be taken up at $23 a share to give an average price in that rather unlikely scenario where 100 percent tender of, I think it's 25.45. So a $35 bid in that, at least a, a, 30, a $30 bid in that circumstance isn't really worth $30. $30. Again, in the paper you can sort of see how the arithmetic works on it, but it's an important matter to be addressed by the directors. One of the critical issues in this whole area is how activist the directors can be in finding what is known as a white knight, a congenial acquirer. Uh, who will presumably not do the nasty things which the offeror is expected to do, the so-called black knight. Now, white knights have a tendency to turn into gray knights and sometimes black knights, but uh, <laughs> there is sometimes a person who is presumed to be a much more congenial acquirer. And these issues have risen, risen in, in recent Canadian cases. First City, Genstar, Canada Permanent, First City made a bid for Canada Permanent. Canada Permanent did not, did not want to uh, com consummate the nuptials with First City and decided to run down the aisle and, and get, drag somebody else to the altar. They did. They got Genstar. Genstar said, look, here, if we're going to go into this sort of thing, we ought to be sure of success, and we've got costs, and we would like to uh, be sure that we, we can uh, uh, lower our average costs. So they they gave them an option to purchase 10 percent of the shares at $25 a share, and Genstar promptly turned around and made a bid at $31 a share. Query whether or not the directors were acting properly in the best interest of the company. Uh, the evidence showed that, that Canada permanent directors applied their mind to this question, obtained legal advice, obtained independent financial advice, and uh, the record also showed that the company was in need of additional equity capital. There have been a number of cases in the United States uh, which have addressed this matter, and in fact, many of them were referred to by the uh, counsel in the Genstar case. The cases, the Marshall Field case, the Krauss-Heinz case, the Treadway case, all stand globally, and, and speaking rather quickly about it because we are going to run out of time, uh, they stand for this principle. The courts will be deferential to the uh, actions taken by directors in a takeover bid context where the directors do not seem to be motivated by self-interest, where their actions are untainted by such reasons as the preservation of control. They will defer to the business judgment uh, of, the, of the directors if the d directors seem to have been reasonably advised under the circumstances. The interesting thing, looking at those cases, and since uh, Genstar was decided there has been another major case in the United States involving Mobile Oil Corporation in its, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, Marathon Oil Corporation, in its attempt to resist the embraces of Mobile uh, and the running into the arms of United States Steel with a series of devices, including an option agreement, the court found business judgment exercise, ex were exercised in the, in the circumstances, again, because the directors were able to demonstrate that although control wouldn't change, that wasn't the primary motive or the sole motive of the, of the actions taken, that there were bona fide good reasons for it. I invite you to consider the excerpts from the cases that are contained in the paper and in the great seamless web of the common law, try to weave them into the Howard Smith and Ampol case, which is a, a decision of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, on appeal from Australia, leading decision of Lord Wilberforce saying, look here, you, you, know, you cannot go ahead and, 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 and deprive, by your actions, deprive the shareholders of an opportunity to, to uh, dispose of their shares. The important decision of Mr. Justice Berger in Tech Corporation and, and Miller, a British Columbia case where the, where the judge said in a much quoted decision that the directors in that case, we're not uh, in attempting to preserve control. They did, in fact, have a legitimate business purpose, and they uh, could look at the question of what the offeror would likely do with the company 
and consider whether or not the shareholders would be, who would remain after the bid would be disadvantaged if this offeror succeeded. Uh, a decision, subsequent decision in Ontario by Mr. Justice Corey on an interlocutory injunction called Bernard and Valentini uh, sort of rounds out the picture in this area. The big debate in the United States now, I must say led um, principally by academics, is whether or not the directors have a, an obligation to remain totally neutral during the, con during the course of a takeover bid and, and let shareholders make up their own minds. There have been a number of important other cases on the fringe areas of the law, some of which haven't gone into the mainstream of the jurisprudence in Ontario uh, and in Canada indeed, and I thought that this, at least for me, provided an opportunity to put some of this into the paper and enrich the dialogue and, and uh, see what the courts will do with it. One of the real causes for jitters in the executive suites is the fact that management, senior management of corporations who are many cases in their 50s and who will be unemployable if they are turfed out by a successful offeror, um, wish to have protection against the eventuality of a takeover bid and contracts have been prepared which have endeavored to remove that sword of Damocles from the, from the directors and from the, at least from the management, from the senior management. And there's a very interesting case from New Zealand, judicial committee case from, Ju from New Zealand, again decided by Lord Wilberforce, who is reckoned to be, at this point in time, one of the great corporate law judges, you know, in the tradition of Evershed and and some of the other great judges. Wilberforce retires in April, but I guess we can still refer to him in the present tense. The case is the Taupo Totara Timber Company case, which certainly sounds very Maori. It's in 1977, three all ERs. In that case, the president had a contract that said that in the event of a takeover bid, he would be entitled to resign and receive a sum equivalent to five times the gross annual salary paid to him in the period immediately prior, the annual period immediately prior to the acquisition and to receive it on a grossed up basis so he paid no tax on it. In other words, the corporation would pay that amount which after taking into account all federal and local taxes would net him that five times amount. Facts were the man had had the contract since in this case 69, takeover bid was in 71, other people had had similar contracts. The judge said uh, speaking for the Privy Council, that uh, there was no question as to the bona fides of the directors in entering into this particular agreement. It was shown that there were similar agreements with, with other employees, and it had been the company's policy for several years, that the uh, provision giving protection in the event of a takeover was in the interest of the company. It was clearly one that reasonable and honest directors might take because in its absence the staff might likely go elsewhere. A, the teaching of the case is clearly a little bit of forward planning in this area might alleviate some of the concerns for the senior management. I won't dwell on the much criticized and wretched case of Percival and Wright. Uh, it has been criticized in a series of English company law cases. Uh, Percival and Wright stands for the proposition that directors owe their duty to the company alone and not to the shareholders. Uh, a, particularly remarkable theory in the context of a takeover bid having regard to the fact that the whole purpose of the bid is to acquire the shares of the offeree shareholders at the lowest possible price. I will simply mention that there is a very important New Zealand decision, Coleman and Myers, which is referred to in the Business Association's casebook that the students use in law school today, Beck gets Gakabuchi and Johnson, uh, at, uh, I don't have the page reference, it's in the footnotes of the paper, as being the, the first recognition in a Commonwealth case that the directors of a company owe the duty to the shareholders. Well, the next portion of the paper deals with how the offeror can, can, can lessen the price. There have been, as I said, a, a number of developments which have addressed the issue of whether or not you can do a multi-step acquisition program and lower the average cost. The Commission has formulated a linkage theory. The 
principal place in which that linkage theory is to be found is the addendum to policy 337, which in effect says that, look here, if you buy all of Mr. Big's shares uh, and you virtually contemporaneously come out and do a pro rata bid to get yourself up to 51% of the shares, then we are going to presume, fellas, that you wanted to make a 100% bid for everybody, and so therefore, if you, t if you take all of Mr. Big's shares up, you're going to take all of everybody else's shares up on the theory that you've got to pay the same consideration to everybody under a takeover bid. Essentially, the addendum integrates the transactions. It stems from, as I say, the Macmillan Blodell transaction where Domtar, um, where, I'm sorry, where Macmillan Blodell acquired all of the Domtar shares from uh, the black interests in the same day or the next day uh, announced a, a, a um, a partial bid, the commission indicated that it would go for a compliance order and the transaction disappeared for other reasons. The issue surfaced again in the FedNav Abbott to be price, uh, Olympia and York, uh, Waltz, and, um, or Polka, and uh, the uh, issues are, are addressed in, in the paper. As I, as I said, the post-linkage question uh, arose in the First City Genstar case, a very interesting case, still before the Commission. Arguments are to be put before the Commission on the law fairly shortly. The, uh, this was sort of an aftermath of, the, of what we were talking about a minute ago. Genstar launched their bid at $31 a share for the common shares. I won't speak about the convertible pref, it just muddies the waters. Uh, they were successful. They, uh, they bought the shares at $31 a share, and shortly thereafter, they bought the shares owned by their former competitor at a higher price, and the question of equality of treatment into a bid gets raised from the Commission's perspective as to whether or not the, the post-bid transaction should be integrated with the bid with the result that the shareholders who tendered at $31 a share should actually be entitled to $34 a share. The acquisition techniques have been many. Uh, option agreements I've discussed. I've discussed them in the context of the director's duties and responsibilities. Standstill agreements are becoming more important. Um, standstill agreements are agreements with a major shareholder to lock him to a particular position. It's an agreement of the sort that was referred to in the newspapers when Canadian Pacific um, entered into an agreement with the Demerat interests to give them a thus far no further sort of approach to their share acquisitions in order to, uh, to satisfy both parties' interests, to preserve Canadian Pacific as a widely held Canadian public company, indeed public institution, I suppose, and to serve Mr. Demeray's interest, which were to equity account for his investment. Equity accounting arises when a shareholder has that number of shares which together with representation on the board will allow him to persuade the accountants that he should be able to account in his financial statements for his proportionate share of the earnings. In other words, if he has 20% of the shares, he should be able to include 20% of the earnings of the investee company and not simply the amount of the dividends that is actually declared, which would be the typical accounting treatment for an investor as opposed to a controlling shareholder. In this whole acquisition scene, another type of agreement that is rather important these days are confidentiality agreements. Confidentiality agreements have surfaced in Canada in situations where, and in the United States for that matter, in situations where a company wishes to dispose of a division or a business and they set up what is known as a data room. And in the data room, they provide all kinds of confidential information to presumptive pres uh, offerors in order to maximize the amount that they would be willing to pay. In other words, look, we will show you our business plan, we will show you our projections, we will show you how technological innovations of the company uh, means that there are hidden asset values in the shares, we will show you that our plant is vis-a-vis -vis that of our competitors 
in a uh, much more modern position, and so therefore our return on the investment, our economies of scale are higher, and therefore you should be willing to pay a better price. The quid pro quo in that, of course, is that you must not use that information um, with anybody else, or you must not use that information to launch a takeover bid. There's a very interesting unreported case in the United States involving the acquisition of General Portland, uh, still strangely enough unreported, which is referred to in the materials. There is a, an even for, for Canadians who are, enjoy and collect Lord Denning decisions, there's a fascinating Lord Denning decision which has not been reported in the traditional reports. The case is a court of, English Court of Appeal decision called Dunford and Elliott versus Johnson and it's reported in 1977, one Lloyd's reports, which is a Lloyd's insurance reports, at 505. Here, a steel company, which was in need of additional capital, capital disclosed certain confidential information to institutional shareholders, which held about 43% of the shares in order to encourage them to invest further in the company. One of the shareholders, having read the material, announced that it was going to make a takeover bid for the steel company, and the company sought to restrain it on the ground of misuse of confidential information. The trial judge granted the injunction. The Court of Appeal unanimously reversed and held that although, the, uh, that although confidential information is entitled to protection against disclosure, the general rule didn't apply because the information had been widely disseminated and in the words of Lord Denning in a vintage Den Denning decision, the, by their actions, the company had pierced a hole in the blanket of confidence. And, <laughs> and by so doing, they had deprived themselves of the opportunity to assert the, the protection that would normally be accorded in such circumstances. He mentioned also that the other rubric in this area was that the, um, that the protection would only be accorded to the extent that it was, not, was reasonable, and the judges, the two judges, uh, Denning and one of the other judges, dumped all over the company for providing differential disclosure, uh, disclosure, in other words, to the institutional shareholders, which was not made available to the general investing public. The question of the preparation of circulars from the standpoint of lawyers is rather important. Uh, I mention only the Canada Cement Lafarge case, which is referred to, has been referred to in a number of panel discussions in other continuing education seminars. There, uh, the lawyers were held to not to have discharged their responsibility in educating the directors in how to prepare a circular in the context of an insider bid, rather important case, dealt with somewhat exhaustively in the paper. Another area of concern that's on the fringes of the law that I alluded to a moment ago is the case of the, of the outside, inside, insider. This is a case of a company which is in the position of a person who signed a standstill agreement. In other words, a person who has 20% of the shares of the company. He has uh, representation on the board of directors, representation on the executive committee, representation on the audit committee, but has been given to understand th that there is no way that the company will accept him going further. There isn't a standstill agreement signed, but they will fight him tooth and nail because he's regarded as an uncongenial acquirer. Nevertheless, despite this uh, attitude, the uh, offeror decides to proceed with a bid query to what extent does he run the risk of, of, of misusing confidential information? Can he be restrained from putting in the circular all the things that he has to put in because he must put in that information which would be reasonably expected to affect the decision of the shareholders as to whether to accept or reject the offer? That's item 16B of the form in uh, the, the information, the offering circular form. A uh, number of very interesting cases. Obviously, the law accepts conf that directors can, can uh, be in a situation where they dire they're directors of, of company A and also directors of company B. There's 
old law school cases, Aberdeen and Blakeney and Bell and Lever brothers, which are referred to in the materials, which don't really throw a lot of light on the matter. You look at the Canero decision and the quickening fiduciary duty, which Dean Beck mentions, the, which is a corporate opportunity case, you don't get a lot of help out of, out, of, out of it because in this case the man isn't misusing a corporate opportunity. You look at the decision of the then Chief Justice of the High Court, Mr. Justice Esty, in Alberts and Mountjoy, which is a case of a competing employee competing against his former employer, and you don't get any help out of it there because there isn't a misuse, presumptively mis a misuse of information. After all, the director, who is the CEO of the offeror company, is laying it all out in the circular because he's obliged to do it by, by the statute. And the statute is designed, as we said, to provide adequate information to the shareholders. I leave you only now with, uh, with the remedies case that I mentioned a, a minute ago. Um, I recognize that Mr. Ground is being rather draconian here. Can I plead another three minutes? Because you, you took a long time in the introduction, too. <laughs> the, uh, the situation with respect to remedies is, 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 a, is a fascinating one, and it, again, it is one on the frontiers of the law. Consider the following situation. Company makes a, a Texas Gulf, Gulf type dis uh, discovery, unbelievable discovery, on Monday the 8th of March. The, the uh, experienced geophysicists decide that they're going to, uh, who are the senior management, decide, well, they're not going to trade, they're not going to tell anybody about it, they're going to wait till Thursday the 11th to tell their board and decide what to do about it. In the meantime, a large trust company sells shares. Shares have been trading at $20 a share. They go to the meeting, they tell the board about it. The board decides that, uh, that, it's, that indeed it's pretty fantastic stuff. Nobody leaves the room. They issue a press release. They stop the trading in the shares to give time for the press release to disseminate. Uh, the, the news disseminates on Friday, and, it's, and the stock is closed down on Monday. The stock jumps to 60 bucks a share and finally settles back at $55 a share. The trust company sold at $25 a share, $20 a share. What's the remedy? Is there a remedy in the statute? 118 of the statute imposes criminal remedies. Section 74 requires a timely disclosure and, uh, of, of material information. I think if you look in the statute, you won't find much of a remedy. If you look in the uh, Seneca College case, Seneca College in Baduria, which is a case under the Human Rights Code, coming from the Court of Appeal of Ontario. Chief Justice speaking for the court said, look, when, when remedial legislation is in place which provides a, 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 a regime of remedies and, and, and admits of, of an appeal to this court ultimately, then we will not imply a remedy. That kind of observation probably applies to takeover bids insofar as people who are protected by Section 127 are concerned. Because Section 127, insofar as takeover bid circulars must contain full, true, and plain disclosure, inures to the benefit of offeree shareholders. But ask yourself the question, to what extent can a competing offeror, who is not in the statutory regime, but who is disadvantaged by underdisclosure or improper disclosure in a circular, to what extent can he obtain an injunction? And, and I leave you with the unreported case uh, of uh, uh, Mr. Justice Anderson in Forefront Consolidated Explorations. It's been since re referred to in a number of decisions, Reed's in uh, First City Genstar and Montgomery's in West Steel, in uh, West Steel Roscoe, I guess it was. No, in, uh, in Royal Trusco number one. In um, the judge's view on an interlocutory injunction, he said that the court should be loath where there is sophisticated remedial legislation in place with the expertise accorded to the Securities Commission, the courts should be loath to intervene. However, I think if you think about the position of the competing offeror, he may well uh, fit squarely within the lacuna left by the Chief Justice in the Seneca College case. Thanks. Now, didn't I tell you that would be exciting? Gordon, thank you. That was absolutely excellent. Uh, we're going to turn you back into the tender care of Gordon Coleman at 345 for the panel.